taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you today. You can say good morning back to me if you want. Good morning. Great, good. I'm glad you're alive today because there's nothing worse than preaching to a dead congregation. I've entitled the sermon this morning, For Whom Are You Seeking? For Whom Are You Seeking? To seek means to go after, to go in search of, or to look for from place to place. It's more than just having a lookout. It means that you're desperately trying to find something. Anybody ever lose their keys? Is there anything more frustrating in the world than losing your keys? I I'm telling you, and you go through your head and you think, I know this is the last place that I had them. And I know for all of my life, they always go right here on this hook or right here in my pocket, and they're not in either place. And so you end up seeking, searching, going through places that you normally wouldn't look for your keys. That's what it means to seek. After the most dreadful experience in her life, Mary Magdalene attempts to put some closure to this chapter. It's supposed to be a happy time. It's the Passover. She was expecting to enjoy this, the greatest of all the holy celebrations with her closest friend. But he's dead now. The preparations have all been made by his disciples. The city is teeming with visitors from all over the world. And all on all of their lips was his name, Jesus of Nazareth. The one who had raised Lazarus from the dead. But she knew him more than just a great healer. It is true, he had healed her. In fact, he had cast seven demons from her. She followed him faithfully since that time. By all accounts, she was one of his closest disciples and most faithful. She had seen him when he was tired she had seen him when he was hungry. But it seemed just in these past few days that 
something was truly weighing on his mind. Every day they came into the city and every night they walked back to the Mount of Olives, to Bethany. Could it have been that harrowing time with Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus? Surely not, since Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead just last week. How could it be fair that Lazarus was alive and Jesus was dead? The Passover would never be the same again. It'll always be linked to his horrible death. He was so alive just three days ago. He had changed her whole life. It almost seemed like there was a different Mary now. She didn't even like to think about that old Mary, full of demons, out of control. But now what? What was she supposed to do now? She had pinned all of her hopes all of our dreams, all of our future on him. It's been so quiet these past three days. No one dared to say anything. Maybe they were still thinking about that horrible afternoon. She'd been there, clinging to his mother and to the disciple that he loved, clinging to a hope a hope that this just couldn't be true. That she would wake up any minute and discover that all of this was just a horrible nightmare. But it wasn't. He was dead. It's cold. And the sun is just starting to come up. This is the earliest that she could safely get to the grave. She was de determined to see that place where he lay to anoint his body properly. Questions were running through her head. Who's going to roll the stone away? Certainly it was too big for her and even the other women that were with her. Would she be able to do this without breaking down? What happens tomorrow? The Passover is only halfway over at this point. Could she continue to celebrate God's deliverance of his people from Egypt? All these things are so heavy on her mind. They were approaching the tomb. She lifts her eyes, trying to see where the stone was. But it wasn't where it was supposed to be. The cave is standing open. And in her mind she says, Oh no. On top of everything else. They desecrated his tomb. They've stolen his body. Why couldn't they just leave him alone? She runs back to the disciples. Peter and John are out of the house and they're running before she can even finish telling them that his body has been stolen. She runs after them. Doesn't even occur to her what she's done with the spices that she was meant to anoint his body. And by the time she catches up to the two disciples, they've been to the tomb and they're already walking back home. She searches their eyes for a glimpse of hope. Please tell her she was wrong. But they don't even look at her. She continues on to the tomb. But she daren't look in. Maybe she hopes that if she doesn't see that he's gone. Maybe she can deny it. And then she starts to weep. And then she starts to sob. Now uncontrollably. It's just too much. On top of all of the things that have happened over the past three days, on top of all the sadness, she just can't help herself anymore. And finally, she looks into the tomb. 
And she told two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus always knows just what to say. Nobody has ever said so much or has ever revealed so much about a person with a simple question. Whom are you seeking? Who was Mary looking for? Her friend? Her healer? Her teacher? Her Lord? At that particular moment, did she even know who she was looking for? All she wanted was Jesus. Jesus finally reveals himself to her with one word. She knew that voice. Mary. This was no dream. He was alive. And in that moment, she reveals, maybe unconsciously, who she was looking for. She responds, Rabbi. It means master, teacher, Lord. So what if Jesus were to ask you a question today? What if he was to ask you the same question that he asked Mary? Whom are you seeking? What if he said it in private so that nobody could hear your answer? What if it was just between you and him? Whom are you seeking? No one's listening. No one's going to judge you. I just want to know, whom are you seeking? What would you say? Maybe you think, well, I'm not seeking anyone. I'm fine just as I am. I don't need anybody. I don't really want anybody. Life is good. I like being in control. I'm happy the way things are. But if you were totally honest, if the person who was asking you that question could not be fooled, if he couldn't be deceived, if he saw right through your words and saw your heart, would you have to say, in fact, you are still looking for somebody? Maybe you're seeking a savior. The Bible says that we are all sinners. We've all turned our own way. And our own way is away from God. The Bible says, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. If you pay attention to the, the words, the phraseology that's going on there, what that means is you as well and me. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. And you might go through all that and say, well, I don't do any of that stuff. That's not me. Well, what about that last sentence? Do you know the way of peace? Be honest. He says there is no fear of God before their eyes. No one can stand before the righteous God of the universe and say, I'm worthy to be here. 
I'm good enough. The Bible says nobody is good enough. Nobody is worthy. The Bible tells us that the judgment on this sin of ours is death. Separation. Forever. Who can say in this room that I have no intentions of dying? I'm just going to skip over that bit. I'll pay my taxes, but dying? No, I don't want any of that. The truth is, whether we want to admit it or not, death is closer than we imagine for all of us. None of us is promised tomorrow. And certainly none of us is promised another century. None of us is getting out of this alive. Why? Well, you may die from one of a hundred various methods, an awful cruel disease, a terrible accident, maybe even old age. Those might be the method by which you die, but that's not what causes your death. What causes your death is the same thing that has caused the death of all of us, our sin. And God promised that that would be the punishment for all of us. And the proof of that is that every single person has also died because God keeps his promises. We are all sinners. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the Bible is not just referring to the physical death that we must all go through, because we will still all go through that. God is also telling us that there is a second death, a spiritual death, the death of your spirit that we all deserve. He says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Well, how is that possible? Well, this second death is separation from God for all eternity. Jesus made it abundantly clear that there is more to this second death than just separation from God, though. Because you might think, well, that's fine with me. I don't care. I don't care about God anyway. If I'm separated from him for all eternity, what does it matter? I don't like him. I don't care for him. I'm not sure if I even believe in him. But Jesus said there's more to just being separated from God. You see, the Bible says that there are only two places that the eternal soul of every single person can dwell. One of those is in the presence of God. Paradise is what the Bible calls that. Heaven is what we know it as. And there's only one other option. And the Bible calls it the lake of fire or hell. The Bible says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You might think, Pastor Glenn, I came here because we were going to talk about life. And we were going to talk about resurrection. I thought there was going to be eggs and bacon rolls. This was supposed to be a great day. And here you are telling me about hell. I have to because how good is heaven if I don't tell you what the opposite is what's the point of heaven if there isn't a hell to be avoided and that is our default position in life the Bible goes on and says and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And then in Luke chapter 12, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Because he is powerful enough to do that. 
you might think, well, I don't want a God that I, can, that I have to be afraid of. And I will tell you, a God that you're not afraid of is not a God at all. And there's only one way to escape this second death. In Romans chapter 3, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable for God, to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. In other words, you cannot ever do enough to stand before God and say, I'm a good person. I am good enough to be here. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to paradise. I want to go to heaven. And look at all the good things that I've done. The Bible says you cannot do that. There aren't enough good works for you to do in your whole life. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who do good things, who give enough money, who just try their hardest. No, for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Jesus did not die to be an example of love and sacrifice to us so that we could follow in his footsteps and thereby get to heaven. If I was willing to die for you, to show you how much I loved you, and there are some in this room that I'd be willing to do that for. The Bible says a, a, a righteous man will die for his friends, although for a stranger, probably not. Most of you I love. Some of you I don't know. I'm sure if I got to know you, I'd love you. But there's probably only a handful of you that I would actually physically lay down my life for. Don't be offended. We're not going to tell you who I would and who I wouldn't. So you can just assume you're one of the ones. But if I was willing to lie, to lay down my life, to die for you, to show you how much I loved you, what would you have gained by my death? If the, if the only reason was for me to say, Zeke, my dear oldest grandson, I love you so much, I'm going to kill myself. What, is, what, is that, what does that prove to Zeke? It proves nothing. Jesus died for much more than just being an example of love. He died so that you wouldn't have to. Now that is love. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not just by listening to him, not just by getting to know him, but by trusting in his death and his burial and his resurrection. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were sinners, Christ did what? He died for us. Jesus Christ is the only Savior from the second death. And this salvation is not attained by mere faith in the fact of Jesus Christ. You might even be here this morning and say, well, I believe that Jesus was a real person. Truth is, less than 50% of the British population believe that Jesus even existed. But there is more evidence to the existence of Jesus than almost any person in history. But that's not enough to save you. Just believing that he existed. It is only possible through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says, what man of you having a, a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after that one that is lost until he finds it? In other words, he seeks it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. 
I tell you a little bit of a little story about, and I hope you don't think less of me because I'm a cat person. We have two little kittens. Well, they're not kittens anymore, but one of them is very skittish, and she just she's nervous and she gets scared all the time. And we had been gone away for a while. When we came back. It was cold. It was windy. It was rainy. It was just. It was. She was just young, and when we opened the door, she flew out. And I went looking for her, and I could see that she was up in a tree. And it's raining and it's freezing, and I'm trying to get this stupid kitten down out of the tree. And I took a ladder and I put it up against the tree, and I climb up the ladder, and I. I can't quite reach her, so I have to climb into the tree, and I'm reaching, reaching, and you know what she did? She scratched me. <laughs> I was being so kind and so nice to her, trying to get her down to bring her in the warm, to let her have some nice food, and she just reaches out and scratches me, and I called her a name. It wasn't a naughty name. I called her a stupid cat, <laughs> and I grabbed her by the scruff of her neck, and I pulled, and she grabbed on the tree, and I was pulling, and she was pulling, and we were pulling against each other. And finally, I pulled her loose, and I started to fall down the ladder, so I dropped her. <laughs> Luckily, cats always land on their feet. She landed on her feet, and she was gone. And I have no idea where she went. And I spent an hour looking around the garden, looking under places, looking inside of things, calling her and calling her and calling her and I finally found her and I was so overjoyed I was so glad because I knew if she stays out here it's going to be awful for her it's going to be terrible for her and I finally found her and all of the rest of you are thinking what's the big deal we, what do we care about this cat of yours and that's the whole point of the story. Because Jesus went looking for his lost sheep. And everybody else is saying, are they even worth it? They don't love you. In fact, half the time when you reach out for them, they scratch you back. Why would you spend all of that effort and energy and time looking for a sheep that you don't even care about? That doesn't care about you. What do we care? But Jesus loves that sheep. Jesus loves you. And he's willing to leave everything else to come and find you. The Bible says, Greater love has no man than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. And then he goes on to say, You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. Is that the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ? Or are you still seeking? So many people are seeking a savior who will wash them away, wash away their sins, excuse me, give them a home in heaven, but then leave them alone. They want a pocket-sized savior. After he's forgiven them, they, they want to put him in their pockets, out of sight, out of mind. He did what I asked, that's all I need. Every once in a while, they may bring him out when they have a need, when they're in trouble, out comes their pocket-sized savior, rub his belly and ask him for things. And hopefully he'll answer that prayer. And if he does, stick him back in his pocket. Some people want a savior for Sundays only. A day to be holy, a day to love Jesus. To be a good Christian. But after all, my time is my own, they say. He should be thankful I've given him Sundays. Giving him more would just be fanatical. Some people are looking for a savior, but not a master. They want the benefits that Christ has to offer, but not the sacrifice that he demands. They want a home in heaven, 
but at the same time feel right at home here on earth. But that's not who Jesus is prepared to be. Jesus, or the Apostle Paul said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. To holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. A sacrifice. That's something you give up. No strings, no provisos, no contracts. So let me ask you the question. Have you ever given Jesus you? Yourself? Not just your heart, but all of you. In other words, is Jesus Christ your master? Maybe you aren't looking for a master, but only a savior. Then I have to be honest with you, Jesus Christ is not who you're looking for. He's not whom you're seeking. Maybe you've accepted him as your savior, but rejected his claim as your master. If that's the case, let me summarize your life. Discontent. Wanting more. Unhappy. Empty. Searching. Disappointed, disillusioned. The real gift that Jesus offers you is not just a future home in heaven. It is himself and a relationship with him. But this is only realized as you embrace him as your savior and as your master. Are you seeking the promises or the peace that, that he promises, excuse me? then you must accept him as your master. As Mary said, Rabboni, master. So let me ask you as I close one more time, whom are you seeking this morning? Are you still seeking a savior? Maybe you're seeking the master. Whichever it is, he's here. He's not in the tomb. Praise the Lord. He's not a distant, cold God. He's waiting right here, right now for you. He said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Maybe that's what you need to reach out to this morning. Well, we are coming to a close on our service. Before the two come up to be baptized, um, I just want to express to you that if you've heard something this morning or if you've seen something that's gone on that has created some questions in your mind, please, please, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. We would love to just sit down and chat and talk more about this. To us, there is nothing more important in the world than you coming to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, to accept him for whom he is. So please don't hesitate to talk to us. All right.